Miracy. It taught me that the way I was brought up as a physician, which is just you work until the work is done, doesn't work. There becomes a point where it's overwhelming, where you can't do anymore, where you need help, where you have to alter the way you do things, get more people to be involved in ways that they may not have ever been before, teach people how to do things that they may not have known how to do before. Welcome, I'm Sharon Richmond, and this is To Lead as Human. For more than 30 years, I've run a business called Leading Large. I help C-level executives expand their impact, clarify their priorities, energize their organizations, and build cultures of accountability and respect. In this podcast, we help you envision how to supercharge your leadership by blending the art and science of leading with intention. I talk with top business leaders who exemplify the principles of leading large. They know that as leaders, the influence they have comes with an equal measure of responsibility. These leaders not only deliver stellar value to their customers, clients, and stakeholders, they prioritize building organizations that provide purpose, meaning, and a healthy work environment for their employees. We have the opportunity to learn from the challenges and successes they've experienced on their own human journey. My guest today is Dr. Ann Weinecker. Ann has been a practicing physician specializing in pulmonology and critical care for more than 30 years, so she's certainly been guiding and leading others for a minute or two. Ann holds numerous senior executive roles at Stanford School of Medicine and Stanford Healthcare, including Senior Vice Chair of Medicine, Associate Chief Medical Officer for Patient Services, and Chief Physician Executive of the Risk Management Department. In most of Anne's roles, she must lead by influencing others rather than using line authority. So she brings a different perspective on leading and on leadership. I'm especially glad to have Anne on the show today as she can also provide a longer term perspective than some of our prior guests. We'll touch on a few key themes, how listening deeply and understanding each stakeholder's perspective helps to build buy-in for needed changes, how she's overcome the imposter syndrome that used to plague her, asking for help, stepping away from a role when you figure out you're the wrong fit for it, and how important her mentors have been to her growth as well as to their own. Welcome to the show, Anne. I'm so grateful to have you here with me today. Thanks, Sharon, and thanks for that generous introduction. Maybe what we could do, Anne, is start by maybe telling our listeners a little bit about the organization and the journey of leadership that you've been through over the last few decades there? Well, I came to Stanford almost 24 years ago, and I came as a very junior faculty member. I had been out of my formal training for just over four years, and I came to this illustrious organization with the sense that they had probably made a mistake by letting me come, but I was going to take advantage of it anyway. And Stanford is a pretty amazing place with numerous Nobel laureates, and those who haven't won Nobel Prizes are still incredibly bright, innovative, interesting, smart, accomplished. I could go on and on. So I think that was my first challenge when I came here was to not let people down and make them realize that they'd made a mistake, that old imposter syndrome, I think, which... I didn't even really know about at that time in my career, but was just so relieved to learn about. Anyway, I started by just doing a lot of clinical work, no leadership roles, really. I had had leadership roles in various other aspects of my life since teenage, actually, but I didn't come here with any leadership role in mind or as a part of the reason that I came here. I really came here to be a clinician taking care of critically ill patients and also to do some amount of research. My first opportunity to lead when I came here was within a few years when my division chief went on sabbatical and he asked me to take on a couple of leadership roles. One of those was he wanted me to be the clinic chief, the person responsible, the physician responsible for our ambulatory clinic at that time. He also asked me to take over as the program director of our pulmonary and critical care fellowship training program. I was flattered, amazed, and intimidated a little bit, 
but took it on and started really by just trying to understand, particularly with the fellows and the training program, where they felt there were needs, where there were gaps in what they were getting and what they felt like they needed. Later, a bigger opportunity came when we were changing the clinical care of patients who were in the cardiac surgical intensive care unit. We developed a separate critical care service to take care of those patients. And the chair of cardiac surgery, because I had known him from other clinical work I had been doing, asked me to help make that happen. So I pulled together a team to do that. And that too worked out quite well. It was a pretty important and not terribly difficult thing to accomplish once I got all of the stakeholders involved. But I think getting everybody on board and getting them to change practice that they had been familiar with for decades, not just years, but decades, was empowering in a way. And then right after that, the person who was in charge of that cardiac surgical ICU service, that team, also went on sabbatical. And I looked to my right, I looked to my left and realized there was nobody else trying to run the show. So I just jumped in and did it. And there were bumps in the road. It was changing the culture in a major way to have intensivists, people who weren't trained to do surgery, to do heart surgery, suddenly now taking care of these patients who had had heart surgery. And at that time, that was almost anathema. So I wonder, because I think people listening are going to want to know, like, When you were first bringing these groups together, you said, well, I had to get these stakeholders on board. Do you remember, like, what did you do that worked? Was there anything surprising or what did you try? You know what? In order to get the stakeholders on board, I already knew so many of the people who were involved in the care of these patients from a variety of different avenues. And so I just reached out to them and said, can you, this is what we're trying to accomplish. The chair of cardiac surgery is behind this. He's endorsing this. He wants it to happen. It needs to because of various groups that look at quality across the country for cardiac surgery. So I had his backing, number one. And that, I think, empowered me to just reach out to folks and say, the chair wants this. And people were happy to join the team. And we met, I don't know if it was monthly or, you know, maybe even a little more often than that to begin with, to determine what all the various pieces needed to be changed from each person's perspective. So I had respiratory therapy and ICU nurses and uh, surgeons and anesthesiologists and just all the people who were involved in the care of these patients from the time they, even before they rolled into the operating room until they ended up in the ICU and uh, we were caring for them. And so found out what was working, what wasn't working, what we needed to change and how might we do it. And so it ultimately was consensus that we would make various changes and work together in ways that we had not ever before. And it turned out to be uh, not only successful, but enduring. And that has been, that was 15 or more years ago. And the process has remained uh, and improved, actually, since then. But the, but the major change that we made, which was how long after a patient came from cardiac surgery did they have to have a breathing tube in place and be on a ventilator, uh, we wanted to have that tube out within uh, 12 to 24 hours. And the practice had been, regardless of what time they came out of the operating room, if the tube wasn't out by... 11 o'clock in the evening, we let them sleep all night with the tube in place and try it again in the morning. That was huge. And so it also bore well for the program that we were able to do that. It was something that was needed and supported by more senior leadership. So you had good executive sponsorship and you had good data for why the change was needed. And then it sounds like maybe those same listening skills uh, is how you got people to come on board. Would you? Does that seem right? I guess I never thought of it that way. But certainly listening is a huge part of getting consensus. It's a huge part of getting buy-in. 
if you don't listen to what people have to say, first off, you miss a lot. Even people who ramble, and I understand that from my own communication style sometimes, say something valuable in the middle of all of that. So you have to listen. Mm. It's important because you learn, but it's also important because if you don't listen, people will shut down and they won't be engaged anymore. They'll feel like, well, if you don't care what I think, why did you bother to ask me? Or why am I even Mm. here? So I think that turns out to be big. I was not cognizant of the fact that asking questions is a very important part of all of this process. I just was the only way I knew to learn anything and to hear what people thought. But I've certainly learned over time to be intentional about asking questions and then to stop talking and let people give an answer. Mm, Really important. So after this piece of the leadership, what else do you remember being kind of maybe uh, key turning points or moments of learning along the way? Yeah, that actually really empowered me to try to take on more leadership. When I saw that what I was doing was supported and successful, it really empowered me to reach out and try to do more. I learned very quickly that when you recognize a problem, people that you might escalate that problem to don't necessarily want to only hear the problem, but if you have a potential solution, they want to hear that as well. And so I felt empowered to start thinking of solutions to problems and then taking that to someone who could be supportive or who could at least not say, that's a crazy idea. What are you thinking? So I think fast forward through a few other leadership opportunities that were not as impactful on my career as it has evolved since then. I was asked to be vice chair of the Department of Medicine. I was flattered to have been asked to be in this role. I had no idea really what the role was. I wasn't ever really given any kind of real guidance as to what the role as the chair envisioned it was. And so it was another situation where I was kind of flying by the seat of my pants. And I did some things, I think, successfully. And some things were just, I I felt like I was spinning my wheels. So what were some of the challenges in that role? What did you learn about yourself and how did you adjust accordingly? I think one of the things that I learned about myself was that I am dogged and persistent and don't give up easily that I can do more than I believed I could do. I also learned that when approaching a job or a role that you don't fully understand, having it clear in my mind, what is it that I'm trying to accomplish and what is expected of me is critical because I think that's why I felt I was spinning my wheels so often. I was so naive. I was so naive when it came to trying to approach some of the challenges that the department was facing and to try to resolve some of the issues that my chair was, uh, I think, expecting me to, to resolve. I also eventually did not feel that I was the right person for that role. Mm -hmm. And I'm not, typically a quitter, but I really felt like there was no way I could be successful in this, in this role. Mm. And so the decision that I had made to step down was the right decision. Wonderful. So after you uh, moved on from that position, what came next? After that position, other leadership opportunities in the hospital actually came up. One of those, which was, I think, really a turning point was when I was asked to be uh, the interim chief quality officer after our chief quality officer left. Uh, And that was the biggest role with some clear, clearly defined um, responsibilities and accountabilities and people to lead. That's the biggest role that I had had up until that point. Now, you know, Sharon, as you said, to begin with, I lead uh, largely by influence and not because I have direct authority over all of the folks that I interact with. And I interact with a lot of people. I think I grew a lot during that time because I had people that I was responsible for. I had metrics I was responsible for. The the hospital's reputation 
actually depended on the work that we did in the quality department. And at the end of the first year, and with the team and with the help from mentorship and the partnership of the person who was the VP, we improved our rankings in one of the national quality scoring uh, systems from 79, I think, out of 105-ish to 12. Oh, that's amazing. Well, it's where Stanford had been before, but over the previous three years or so, it had slipped. Um, Mm. So with a lot of work, we came up. And that was, again, I'm not taking credit for this, but that was also incredibly empowering, that being part of that and being part of that success. And, And then having been seen by the organization as having a leadership role in that success, that helped a lot as well. Yeah. And now you and I met a couple of years before that. And I remember, do you remember like what were some of the top issues when we first met that we first started talking about? The main thing that I remember is to sort of quote, I guess, the first George Bush, um, strategery is not my strong point. I am not (laughs) as strategic a thinker as I would love to be. I am pretty good at operations. When I see things that need to be fixed, I know how to fix them. I'm not as good at strategic planning over, you know, weeks, months, years uh, in advance to try to figure out where are we going. You know, I, I kind of look at the road where we're headed right now and go, whoa, that's that's not really where we want to go. How do we fix that? So mm-hmm. I remember that as as one of the one of the biggest uh, challenges that I faced then and am facing still. I, I am who I am, and I've come to terms with that to some extent, but I still try to learn how to be strategic wherever I can and plan ahead. Well, and I think it's one of the things that I appreciate is that you recognize what you're really good at and where you have an opportunity to grow, and then you find people that can help you with that. And so to me, that feels like a pretty important evolution in one's leadership is how do you know when it's okay to like ask for help? You know, I think that's a really... I think that's a really important question. How do you know when it's important to ask for help? And and I think whenever you don't know how to do something, whenever you don't know what the path forward is, that's when you ask for help. I just said this to a a candidate for a faculty position here who is still doing um, a fellowship and is hoping to join our faculty this summer. And she was saying, you know, she's a little intimidated by taking this next step. And what I said to her then was, you always will have questions. You'll always need to know more. You have to be able to ask questions. But I think when you're in a position where you are a new leader or in a new role and you don't know the system or the people well, you have to find a few people that you trust to ask questions. Trust that know the answers, but that you can trust to ask the question. Uh, because I, I remember feeling, even as a brand new faculty member, when I left my formal training and took my first job, thought I was supposed to know everything and felt like an idiot to have to ask questions of anyone. And I found a couple of people that I knew I could trust who could give me good advice and wouldn't think, oh my goodness, we've made such a mistake hiring this woman. So I think you should always ask questions when you don't know what to do. Having said that, you need to come a little bit prepared with some background knowledge. If you do go into something asking a question about which you know nothing, uh, then clearly it may be that the person you ask wonder, what were you thinking? Have you not looked into this? Do you not have any ideas of your own? You know, I'm, I'm not your mother. I'm going to help with advice, but I hope you have some ideas of your own. So I love that you talked earlier about the imposter syndrome and you know, how present that has been for you at different times. You know, looking back, I wonder, are there some things that you did to help yourself kind of put that aside, at least temporarily, so that you could lean into these big roles? I don't think I consciously put aside those feelings. They plagued me for years, years. And I don't think you can just tell yourself that you're not an imposter and that you are all the things people think you are. You you can't look in the mirror and say, I'm all the things they think I am. I'm just as wonderful as they think. You think about yourself what you think about yourself. And what influences that, I really believe, are your successes and failures. And I think the more 
successes, the more empowering it is. Uh, some of the things that I mentioned that I did before that turned out well, each one of those was empowering and made me feel like, well, maybe I'm not the least qualified person here at Stanford. I'm still pretty <laughs> low on the list, but I'm not the least qualified. And then a real turning point for me was when the mentor who had been supportive of me, who put me up for leadership roles, who offered me advice, et cetera. I really respect this person tremendously. And I remember a time when he said something that I totally disagreed with in terms of what needed to be done, or I can't remember if it was a judgment about something or exactly what the issue was, but he said something that I thought, I wouldn't do it that way. I don't agree with that. And I, I felt right in what I was thinking. And just the recognition that I had an independent thought that was different from what my mentor had and that I believed in it um, and that I actually thought he could have done something better or could have been thinking something different about the issue. That, that was huge, actually. It was huge. So it didn't, it didn't turn the switch off, but it certainly dimmed it a lot. And did you tell him that idea? Did you share that? No, no, but I can't remember, honestly. I I honestly can't remember. I I can say that there was a time when he was facing, this was earlier in our relationship, and, and I didn't know it at the time. He only told me years later it was a turning point in our relationship. He was engaged in a disagreement, very uncomfortable disagreement with another faculty member. And he was hurt by it as much as angered by it, more more probably than angered by it. And and I was still pretty junior at this point. So I remember feeling a bit gutsy to tell him what I really thought, um, which was I did think that the other person acted very unwisely. But I also told him what I thought he might have done differently. I couldn't believe it when I heard the words coming out of my mouth. But, you know, I have learned sometimes accidentally because I'm backed into it and I've learned because I've had outstanding coaching to help me learn to confront issues and to say what I think when I think it's important to do so. So I don't remember if I said anything to him at that point because it was probably trivial. It's just it was something minor. But this particular Mm. instance, like I said, I didn't know until years later that it was a turning point in our relationship, which what a happy, lucky turn for me. Well, and that, you know, not to put too fine a point on it, but having the courage to do that, I'm guessing that it changed the way he saw you and that it shifted his feelings of being able to trust you. Is that fair? Uh, Probably. And I would imagine that that's true. And being supportive in a situation where he really needed some support, you know, that's always nice when somebody does something nice for you when you need something nice done for you. So maybe it was a combination. So, Anne, as you're thinking back over the arc of your own leadership journey, I'm wondering, how would you describe your approach to leadership? Do you have guiding principles or some key thoughts? I used to think that I knew everything. Now, I don't really mean that based on what you've heard me say about the imposter syndrome, that I know everything, but that when I had an opinion on something, it was the right one. And I've learned that it's not always the right one. There are so many more perspectives than the one that I may come with or the ones that I may come with. I think ask questions, listen, and trust that the answers are valid on some level. When you hear multiple different answers to the same question from different people, it's important too to recognize that not one of those answers is the right answer necessarily, but that there's some blend or that there's some compromise that can be reached when there are very different, almost opposing answers to the same question. So I think that's something that's really important. I think that it's also important, and I still struggle with this because I'm a little bit of a micromanager, hopefully not as much as I used to be, but I know I tend to get very deep in the weeds, is to empower people to make decisions and then trust them to do what they were asked. I think it's important to empower people to make decisions and then trust them to do the work that you've asked them to do. It's also important to keep your finger on the pulse 
to make sure that things are moving in the right direction, that the person that you've entrusted is up to the task or doesn't need help or doesn't have questions. So I don't think that it's just, here's what I want you to do and then send them off on their own and see if they can ride the bike or not. But I do think it's important to let people make decisions. It's also important to be open to feedback and influence from people when they give you that gift. So it's very important to to listen when people give you feedback and to decide what to do with it. But recognize that whatever they're telling you is their truth. And so you have to at least hear it and determine what are you going to do with that information. Can I ask you a quick question about that before we go to the next point? I don't Mm -hmm. want you to lose your train of thought. No, go ahead. Um, So what's an example of, can you think of a time when you've done that with someone and how has it played out? Like what made it work? Maybe the most recent example is I'm working with someone currently co-chairing a group that has, that was convened earlier this year to resolve a years long, maybe even decades long challenge here in terms of one of the processes that we have for bringing patients into the hospital, admitting patients into the hospital. And there's a lot of culture wrapped around that and a lot of emotion wrapped around the way we currently do things and lots of different opinions. And so it it has led to a lot of tension over the last many years. The person that I'm co-chairing this group with is more junior, has not had as many leadership opportunities. Um, And I have worked to empower that person to take on roles themselves and to do things when there are things that we need to get done rather than just go do it all myself, which is my fallback position, is really to ask them to take on some portions of the role and to empower them to take on more and more of the leadership. And that has largely been successful. And I I can see some growth in that person as a result of it. I still at times feel a need to, you know, guide or help course correct. But I've also learned that even when I do that, they're coming from a different perspective than I am. And sometimes they bring up a point that I had not known about or had not considered. So I think there's got to be always that flexibility and that ability to be open to influence, to be open to feedback. And that gets to another point, I guess, which is to be open to new ideas and not be overly attached to my own ideas. Someone uh, very wise once said to me, hold your truths lightly. And, um, you know, I think that's, that's actually a very valuable lesson. And then be curious. That's all part of it, is to be curious. Once I gave up on the idea that I actually all of my opinions were the right opinions. It helped me to be more curious and to ask more questions. And how do you see people reacting differently to you now that you are a little more in that open and receptive mode than, uh, say, earlier on? I think people respond very positively to being respected, for their opinions to be respected, for their voice to be respected, for their voice to be heard. And People don't cross their arms in front of me as much as they may have years ago or stared at me with a blank stare. Like, what is she saying? How could she possibly believe that? Because I can hear what they're saying and react to it. And I've also learned not to have a negative response to what I've been told. To automatically, in my mind, disagree and then vocalize that in some way or another. Subtly or not so subtly. Mm. Or argue, yeah, but. I think I used to, yeah, but a lot. And now I don't, I try not. I don't know. I probably still do. Old habits die hard. But I think it's very important. And people do respond better. And they're more likely to get on board and then to bring other people in. Or suggest, you know, I don't know the answer, but let's ask this other person. Mm. So I think it's a very much more efficient and effective way to lead or to get things done to get where we're trying to go. Was there more about the leadership principles that you wanted to share? I think supporting the folks that you're working with and mentoring them where you can, I think it's important to be fair and honest and transparent is a word that some people don't 
fully understand, but I think letting people know what you're thinking when it's an important when it's important for them to know that. So I think be fair, be honest, be transparent. And then I think something that we don't do often enough is to give honest praise freely and often. It is very easy to say, what were you thinking? Or I wouldn't do it that way. Or I'm not sure why you've chosen this, but here's a better way. I think when people do something that deserves praise, then praise them. And it doesn't have to be that they change the course of the world. It has to be whatever it was they're working on and they were successful. What a great job. Thanks. That was really helpful. And to do it over and over again. I think praise is easy. It doesn't cost anything. And everybody really enjoys a sincere compliment. And I think that last piece, sincere, is also important. Empty praise most people can see right through it. So what's an example of a better way to praise? How Just re, something recent, just to give people a good illustration so they maybe don't keep following the same empty praise. I think when someone does something well, telling them what it was that they did that you are particularly impressed by or that you think they did well. Mm-hmm. Just thank you for doing this or thank you for all of your hard work. Uh, You can only say that a few times before it it becomes hollow. But to point out, I know it was really tough to talk with so-and-so and and work this out. And this was out of your comfort zone. So thank you so much for doing it. And it really seems to be working well. That's the kind of praise that people will buy when you try to sell it. Because you're not selling something. You're just telling them what you believe. That's a great example. You know, the title of this podcast is To Lead as Human. And I like to ask each guest, what does this mean to you as a leader, to lead as human? Huh. I guess I've never thought about that. In a way, to lead as human, it's almost a flip to me. In medicine, we know about the book that came out from the Institute of Medicine years ago, decades ago now, to err as human, which basically says we're all going to make mistakes. You've got to accept it and deal with it and do what you can to minimize errors. I almost think of to lead as human flipped. And in order to lead humans, you have to be human. You have to be that person that you would respect as a leader. You have to be the person who you would stop talking to listen to. You have to be the person who will ask questions in a way that folks will feel comfortable answering you. And that they won't feel that your question is an accusation or a test. So I think it's a little bit different from the way I would have, the way I did maybe think about it when I first saw this title. Yeah, I love that. That's great. So I think we're all really aware of the stresses on the healthcare environment over the last few years of the COVID epidemic. And I'm just wondering, Anne. How has that stretched you as a leader? And is there something that you've learned along the way that is a little new or different? Wow. COVID has changed everything about everything. In healthcare, and in my field in particular, internal medicine and critical care, that's where COVID has had the greatest impact. That's where the workforce of physicians has been stressed and stretched beyond limits. Certainly the nurses, respiratory therapists, all of the other people in the hospital are stressed by the amazingly increased work that's associated with it. But as a critical care physician, and we certainly had plenty of patients, not as many as some places, fortunately, but we had a number of patients who were in the intensive care unit for a long time with COVID, many of whom died, some of whom required lung transplants, some of whom are respiratory cripples because of COVID. Um, It taught me that the way I was sort of brought up as a physician, and, and I'll leave out the nurses and all the others who are, it's almost cliche now to say heroes, but everybody who took care of a patient with COVID, particularly in the early part of the epidemic, when you didn't know if walking in the room was a death sentence for yourself, or potentially even your family, if you took at home on your shoes even. I mean, people had no idea back then. But it taught me that the way I was brought up as a physician, which is just you work 
until the work is done doesn't work. There becomes a point where it's overwhelming, where you can't do anymore, where you need help, where you have to alter the way you do things, get more people to be involved in ways that they may not have ever been before, teach people how to do things that they may not have known how to do before. But that's, a, I hope, a very unique and once in a lifetime kind of experience for most of us to be stretched to that extent. But it also has shown that the only way to tackle a problem as big as this is to work together. And in our own healthcare system, we have become more of a system than we ever were. We have an adult hospital, a children's hospital, a community hospital where we take care of inpatients. And we have two foundations, one that cares predominantly for uh, children and one that cares predominantly for adults. And we were never really a system attacking a big problem like this before and doing it, being in lockstep in the way that we did it. And COVID forced us together and forced us to figure ways to deal with supply chain issues, fear among the nurses and the respiratory therapists and the physicians. How do we protect each other? Data were coming out so fast you couldn't keep up with it. And what we thought we needed to do and how we needed to take care of this horrible illness was changing so fast that we had to try to be all on the same page. And then we had to figure out how to communicate every time something changed. And sometimes things changed on a day-to-day or a week-to-week basis. So I think that's another thing that we learned, which is how do we work together? And, And we've actually benefited, I think, a lot as a system from that exercise, as challenging as it was, as horrible a situation as COVID has been socially, uh, medically, every other way you can think of, um, that has been an upside. And then just recognizing that people are tired. Yeah. I'm hearing a lot of empathy in what you're saying. I'm hearing a lot of tuning in differently to the personal journeys of the physicians, as well as of the other caretakers and the patients. But, you know, something different in the leadership may be around how we empathize with each other and how we communicate. Were there changes in your leadership practices that reflect that? Well, yeah, I think so. Because again, you know, I was brought up, you work until the work is done. It was, medicine wasn't a job. It wasn't a career. It's a lifestyle. It's a vocation. Mm. Nobody would ever say those words now. Um, I don't think. During my era, I think of all the times when I ignored my family because I had to go back to the hospital or because I couldn't come home from the hospital. And so I've really had to shift the way I think and realize that the way I've always done things is not normal. It was normal in our time, but you know, most of us who were brought up in that era are either no longer around or have recognized that it was nuts. And that's not how we need to be doing things. So that has been a big piece of what I've learned as well, is different people have different limits, different people have different needs, and we have to be able to support each other in ways that we may never have thought about before, and maybe to degrees that we never would have considered before. That also sounds to me like recognizing that it's human beings in all these jobs, and that each human being needs to be seen and acknowledged as that person and seen as that individual that they are. It's certainly different from the early days of medical training. It is. It is. And everybody in this job is human, including Mm -hmm. the critically ill patient in front of you who has so many lines and tubes and things that they don't look like anybody's Aunt Sue anymore, but they are. Mm -hmm. And their relatives are often, when someone is that ill, suffering. And at the height of the pandemic, we weren't letting their relatives in even when patients were dying. That was heartbreaking, heartbreaking. And I think it pointed up again, everybody in these jobs, whether we're, regardless of what side of the hospital gown we're on, everybody's human and has to be seen and treated that way. Mm, That's beautiful. So in wrapping up, I just wonder, Anne, if there's a last piece of advice or something that you've learned that 
maybe something kind of counterintuitive that you'd like to leave our listeners with? I think that if I can give any advice to anyone, it is to recognize the imposter syndrome that I've brought up so many times. I think recognize that we all have some bit of that that drives us to keep going, not to fail, not to let people down, not to prove they were wrong and that we're right, that we can't do this. So in some way, being able to get past that by putting yourself out there, starting with things that you know you can be successful at, because I think that's very important, that successes are what help chip away at that sense of being an imposter and not being able to do things. When you prove to yourself and others, and it's really more proving to yourself, that you can do something, it really does make you capable of taking on more and more and capable of leading in areas where you have the ability. Thank you so much, Anne. I'm so grateful for you being with us here today. And where can listeners find out more about you if they'd like to learn more about who you are and what you're doing? Well, you could go to the Stanford University website or the Stanford Healthcare website. There are two different ones. Um, The Stanford Healthcare is more related to the hospital and what my practice is. More about what my current roles are would be on the Stanford University website. And then if you really get desperate and you can't remember any of that, you can you can actually Google me, which blew my granddaughter out of the water when she found out she could Google me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's adorable. And find something. And, and find something. Oh, that's great. And find something that I bet she feels very proud of. I'm certainly grateful to have someone as accomplished as you are and as experienced as you are come and share your own leadership journey with us. So let me just say a big, big thanks to Ann Weinecker, Dr. Ann Weinecker, for this conversation. I'm so grateful for your being here today. Thanks for coming on this show. You're welcome. I'm very happy to have done it. I hope it's helpful. Please keep listening as I share a few key takeaways from my conversation with Ann. First, let me say one thing I appreciate about Anne is that she cuts right to the chase all the time, even when it comes to her own strengths and gaps. So I love how she laughed when she said strategery isn't her greatest strength. She sees herself as a fixer, someone who can take the naughtiest of operational problems and figure out how to get it fixed. And this strength continues to serve her well. Anne's effectiveness has continued to grow as she's advanced into more and more senior positions. She now more easily makes the internal shift from judgmental to curious. Then she asks key questions that help her teams surface the hidden issues, flesh them out, and arrive at a new potential solution. One key thing that Anne mentioned is that she's learned how to graciously accept the gift of feedback. It's quite common for all of us to feel defensive when we get feedback whether we've asked for it or not. If you'd like to learn, as Anne has, to welcome feedback and learn from it, let me give you a few tips. First, separate out the critique of what you did from who you are. Feedback is not personal, and it's most helpful when it's specific and highlights the impact you had in the interaction they're talking about. Acknowledge that impact, even if it's not what you thought would happen. Second ask for clarity. If you didn't get the results you wanted, the outcomes you wanted, ask the feedback provider, what could you have done differently to be closer to achieving your intended impact? The third thing, of course, we shouldn't need to say this, but be appreciative. Thank the other person. They've given you the gift of telling you their truth, and it's especially valuable when it differs from your own. Fourth, Decide if you need to try something new to be more effective, and then ask others if you're making that change will improve things for how they interact with you. And last, close the loop. Follow up with the person who gave you the feedback. Describe what you've been trying to do differently and ask them if they've seen the difference. If you do try this out, let me know how it works for you. As Anne says, 
building a string of small successes can help overcome imposter syndrome, and so can learning from the feedback others offer you. I'm Sharon Richmond, and this has been To Lead as Human. You can find out more about me at leadinglarge.com. That's L-E-A-D-I-N-G, large.com. To Lead as Human is part of the Miracy FM podcast network, which also includes such shows as Soul Savvy Business and Making It. This episode was produced by Cynthia Lamb. Jeff Govertson assembled the episode. Danny Eaney is our executive producer, and post-production is provided by Post Office Sound. So you don't miss upcoming episodes, please follow us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're listening right now. If you like the show, first, please leave us a starred review. Then tell your colleagues about us. It really does help us spread the word about leading from the core of being human. Thank you so much for listening. And I'll see you next time on To Lead is Human.